Well, welcome everybody. I'm Brianna Jarena, your host for today's Justice Talk event and a member of the Dynamic FYP team, first year programs team. Thank you so much for joining us for our third event in our October series, From Justice Talk to Justice Walk. Uh, this series emerged from our incredible first year students who explored a variety of justice issues last summer and kept asking, well, what can I do, right? Uh, so we've brought the series back for a second year in hopes of giving you all the change makers uh, some tools to make a difference in your own ways. I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague and co-host, Dinette, to introduce our special guest. What's up, guys? My name is Dinette Suomani, and today I have the honor to introduce Dr. Crystal Jackson, leading today's workshop titled Fiercely Feminist, Feminists of Colors Creating Change. Dr. Jackson, the current director of the Gender Studies Program here at John Jay, is a feminist scholar activist who studies sexual laborers and sex worker rights organizing in the United States. Her research and teaching addresses inequalities and social justice responses to social problems through feminism, first advocacy and education as liberation. As a self-identified bisexual slash queer femme, Dr. Jackson served two years as a faculty advisor for the LGBTQ plus and ally student club, which is now called Spectra. So guys, please help me to give Dr. Jackson a warm Zoom welcome. Oh, thanks, everybody. Hi, thanks, Nana, and, and just the whole team over at SAS and the first year, um, first year programs. So I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited to see some names that I know, but a lot that I don't know, which is also very exciting. Um, so uh, again, my name is uh, Dr. Jackson. I go by she, her, they, them pronouns. I tend to flow with my pronouns depending on how I'm feeling about my gender that day or the space that I'm in. Um, uh, I have been here at John Jay since 2013, which is a long time. Um, and before that, I'm from Las Vegas. So if you also have Vegas questions, you can ask me about that later. <laughs> uh, but today I am gonna be presenting on, on fiercely feminists, fierce feminisms, and really looking at how feminists of color in particular have always been the ones who have been leading the way um, in the US and around the world. Um, and I'm you know, a white person. Um, uh, but I, in my research and my friendships and my activism, right, have long recognized that, um, you know, I am a racial justice ally and that it's really feminists of color who have led the way around everything from fighting police brutality to getting rights around um, women's ability to, you know, uh, leave violent situations at home, right? The rise of domestic violence shelters, rape crisis centers, right? Um, it's, you know, feminists of color who are really leading us then and still today. So I do have a presentation, um, but I encourage you to ask questions as I'm presenting. Um, you know, you can ask them in the chat, you can raise hands, like they said. Um, and yeah, I think we'll get going from there. So while I bring this up, I also want to do a land acknowledgement. Um, this might be something that you have seen or heard in other courses, there we go, um, or other events where we acknowledge the fact that we are on, right? If you're in the New York, New Jersey area, we're on indigenous land, right? So we are on the Nape land. Um, and so especially because today we're gonna be talking about inequalities, it feels particularly important to talk about what it means to be talking about inequalities when we're actually part of occupying forces that are on stolen land, right? Um, and what that really means. Um, you know, this is a continuing ongoing issue and crisis. Um, and so this is why oftentimes we turn then to feminists of color, including indigenous feminists um, for what to do, how to fix it, how to be better and how to make the world a better place. So I kind of want to get an idea, and I'll, I'll stop sharing here in a second because I want to be able to see the chat. Um, I want to get an idea of what you think of when you hear the word feminism. What is feminism? What do feminists advocate for? You know, write some stuff in the chat. We're at John Jay. We are fierce advocates for justice. So what does fierce advocacy for gender justice mean when you hear that or think about that? So what do you think of when you hear the word feminism? Good, yeah, feminism is the right, uh, the fight for equal rights for all genders, right? Uh, girl power, right? <laughs> all genders, I like that because we're not just talking about women and this sort of narrow way, but talking about 
women and men and, you know, people who are gender non-binary and including, you know, there's cisgender women and transgender women, there's transgender men, cisgender men, right? Cis uh, gender refers to people who were, um, who've never questioned their gender identity, right? So cisgender means you were born, the baby said, the doctor said, babies don't talk yet. Uh, the doctor said, this baby is a girl and you've always sort of identified as, you know, a girl and a woman and female and femme. Um, whereas trans people at some point, they're like, mm, this, this is not my gender. I don't identify this way. Um, and same with gender non-binary or gender non-conforming people. Let's see, Evelyn says, when I hear feminism, I think of social and political movements, good, and social equality of, the, of sexes. Okay, nice. Um, this is good because we're starting to get into the ways like people can be feminist, right? Like I am a feminist, um, but there's also feminist movements. Um, exactly, feminist activism, right? Um, and these efforts, for example, the Women's March that's been happening um, around the country ever since Trump was elected, right? Every January now there's these women's marches. Um, you think of the word advocacy. Yes, because we're at John Jay and we are, right? We are educating uh, for justice. You are all fierce advocates for justice and training. All right, anything else? What about stereotypes? Any stereotypes you, you hear about feminists, who feminists are, what they do? I mean, is feminism just cool now because Beyonce had it in giant letters like years ago and like sings about it? Or do you think that there's still some like hate against feminists today? Oh, I think I see a hand raised. You can go ahead, Anna. You can unmute yourself. Uh, I remember like when I was like in middle school around 2016, there was like a whole like social justice warrior thing and people used to make like videos reacting to like, quote unquote, these radical crazy feminists and oh my God, they want to like change everything. And I feel like, that's usually what a lot of people think feminism is, especially when like a lot of these videos have indoctrinated like a lot of young men. Like I know like mostly like in my family, I used to see like my cousins watch these videos and kind of like have like a sick like feeling in my stomach and kind of them thinking that all oh, feminists are like this and that. And then every time I would say something, they would be like, oh, you're going into those like feminists with purple hair and short hair who like think they're gay and like all those like very like awful stereotypical stuff when in reality like feminism is not like that like and it's just sad because like everyone wants equality and that's what feminism feminism is trying to fight for but like videos like that and people who spread that type of message kind of ruin it yeah absolutely oh my gosh you like totally um encapsulated so many things like and it's funny because like I have had short purple hair <laughs> and I do have a, get identify as queer and bi, right? Um, but it's the idea that that using that and trying to weaponize identity, right? Um, as a way to indicate that that you shouldn't be loud and you shouldn't be heard, right? Um, and I was like, yeah, I got red hair. And you know, some of these things, I see some of our hands up and I also see some things in the chat. Like people think of, of feminism as just women hating men. And it's like, we don't, hate men. We just want men to stop raping us and beating us and hurting our kids. We want them to stop, you know, um, you know, being so violent. Right. Um, there's still a lot of hate. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think I saw a couple hands. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, basically oh, I see in the group chat, a bunch of them are saying that feminists are labeled as man haters. They want to have more dominance over men in society, which is not true. And then the way how the social like media in general just portrays feminists as those who just are just a bunch of females that are complaining for no reason, which is not true. Yes, yes. And those are two really good points I'm writing down so I don't uh, forget. Those are two really good points because there's this issue of power, right? So this issue of like, there's an assumption that if people are fighting for their rights, that, that they're going to be taking power away from someone. And it's kind of like, well, yeah. Right. So when we fight for racial justice, right, we're actually asking that white supremacy be dismantled. And that, for example, we don't have you know, um, say in the US, our main, you know, governments, both at the federal and state levels, it's overwhelmingly old, white, straight, cis, Christian dudes. 
right? And that doesn't really represent the population, right? So um, it is often scary for people to think about, you know, challenging the status quo because they're like, well, things are the way that they are and they've always been this way. And that's not true. Um, but that's a really powerful way of convincing people to accept, right, the violences that they're experiencing in their lives or the inequalities that they experience in, the li in their lives. Like we have so much data that shows that, you know, that racism and sexism and transphobia and homophobia are are alive and well today in all areas, in education, in the criminal justice system, in economics, in the workplace, in our families, right? Um, yeah, exactly. Like Maria was saying, uh, we, uh, we want pay uh, equality in the workplace, not, you know, not for women, but also for our kids and our kids' kids, right? Closing that inequality pay gap, which is a really good example to bring up because oftentimes we hear, well, women make and it changes kind of depending on which data that you're using. Women make 88 cents on the dollar for every dollar a man makes, right? But if you break that down by gender and race, you start to see a much different story. And you see how, for example, white women, right? Um, like myself, uh, nationally will make more than black men, right? Um, so it's important to look at both gender and race. And that's what intersectional feminists and feminists of color, right, are asking us to do. Um, and so that's why I'm giving this talk today to really point out that we can't just talk about gender, we also have to talk about race. Um, and also this idea of complaining, right, that you talked about, and it's like, yeah, it's good to complain. We complain because things aren't right, right? And talking about it as complaining or, um, there's this really awesome black feminist scholar, Brittany Cooper, and she wrote about, she wrote a book called Eloquent Rage um, because of that stereotype uh, of black women being quote unquote angry all the time. And she's like, yeah, we, we do have a rage inside of us, but it's a righteous rage. It's a rage that is necessary because the world is so unfair. And so she writes about it as an eloquent rage that is necessary to help create the changes that we wanna see in the world. Um, yeah, like uh, Kaya, Kaya, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, said it's not that we want power over men, we just want to have, we just want to have the same amount, quote unquote, of power, right? We, we don't want there to be that power imbalance. Um, good. Oh, I like this. Y'all have some good ideas. This is good. Okay, so I'm going to go back to sharing screen, do a little bit more description and explanation, and then we'll continue talking. Oh, hold on. There's one more message here. I want to see it. Um, yeah, exactly. Right. This idea. So someone also added that, you know, tends to be women and femmes tend to do the majority of housework, right, which is labor, but it's unpaid labor. Right. Uh, whereas men um, and mass people tend not to, although that is one thing that has changed um, or is changing, although it's still not great. Um, is how uh, there has been, you know, a change over the past 30, 40 years where you do see men in hetero relationships, right? Because that's really what that's talking about. Men in those relationships actually doing more, you know, childcare, if there's children in the home, more work around the house, more cooking, right? Some of those stereotypes against what's considered masculine have fallen away. Um, good, so I'm gonna go ahead and just um, continue on um, and give you some examples of how, you know, you can be feminist or get involved with feminist movements and just how feminists make the world, you know, a better place. Um, and I do this uh, coming from my perspective as an activist and also a scholar or scholar activist. So I'm going to show a lot of covers of books because I, I mean, I'd like to say I'm dorky, but you should be dorky too because you're at John Jay and you're learning. So these are covers of books um, by scholars of color about issues that people of color are facing, right? Um, and so, for example, on the far left, you have the young women of color on today's feminism, you know, that's titled Colonize This. Uh, reproductive rights is human rights, women of color in the fight for reproductive justice, right? So feminists of color have been advocating for equity and justice and inclusivity for as long as they've been advocating. And they do so from this intersectional lens showing how racism and sexism intersect as well as other aspects of self too. So usually we're also talking about sexuality and sexual identity, gender expression, age, citizenship status, body size or type, right? Um, but really understanding that we can't just look at gender alone because if we do that, then, then some issues come up, which I'll give you some examples of here. So I wanted to provide this example, right? So this is an intersectional feminist mapping of reproductive justice in the US, right? 
the U.S. has a really long history of reproductive violence. Um, we often hear about lack of access to abortion, like what's happening in Texas right now, where they have effectively outlawed abortion in Texas and actually criminalized people who are seeking and the people who help them um, seek abortions, right? So it's a bounty-driven surveillance system and a criminalizing of abortion. Um, and access to abortion is really important, but it's not the only thing. And so when we think about reproductive justice, what we're really talking about um, is justice for reproductive health. So reproductive health care refers to everything from being able to access abortion, but also, you know, STI and HIV testing, um, prenatal care, um, care while pregnant, post-pregnancy care, menopausal care, right? Um, you know, going in and getting annual exams, you know, um, if, you know, going to an OBGYN or going in for prostate exams once you get to a certain age, right? So reproductive health, right, encapsulates all those things, right, about how and when you are caring for your body, whether or not you want to have children, that's really matter, right, that you're still engaging in sexuality. So that, that reproductive part is a little, um, little judgy, right, because plenty of people are having sex and not interested in reproduction in the moment. Um, and so reproductive justice becomes this overarching way of talking about not just abortion, but also other aspects of, of the right to have a family. So for example, um, here in the US, we have um, detention and deportation centers where undocumented immigrants um, are, you know, if they're arrested, um, they are uh, jailed in these detention centers and they are jails, right? They are prisons. They are built by the same companies that build jails and prisons in the US. Um, and they're getting funds, right, from Homeland Security or through ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Right. And what's been happening, um, if you remember last year, there was a woman who was actually a whistleblower, a nurse who was working at one of those uh, detention centers because women were being sterilized, as in not they would not be able to have children anymore. Right. Having their what they say tubes tied um, colloquially they were being sterilized without their knowledge and against their will. And the U.S. has a very long history of doing this. We, we did it in California in the 70s with women who were going to hospitals that were like the county hospitals. Um, and so this was particularly Latina women who were going in. They were pregnant. They gave birth. Um, and after giving birth, the doctors would go in and sterilize them without their knowledge. And so then when they tried to get pregnant again, they were like, why can't I get pregnant? And then find out that they can't have babies anymore. Um, the U.S. does this fairly regularly in certain jails or prisons across the, in different states, right? So it kind of depends on which state you're in. Um, this is supposed to be something that we don't do anymore, but yet it happens fairly regularly. So reproductive justice also means not being sterilized against your will or not being sterilized uh, and not even told about it, right? Um, and that's coming at the hand of the state, right? That's, that's our governments doing that to people. You can also think about reproductive justice as the right to have a child and not worry that your child is gonna be killed by police. And so Black Lives Matter is an intersectional feminist movement. Black Lives Matter was started by three black queer women and Black Lives Matter is focused very much on, on, um, uh, on fighting right, police brutality um, in the sense that police brutality is also you know, ruining families, right? Like you deserve to have a child and not have to have a conversation with your child um, about you know, avoiding police because black children and Latinx children, particularly black and Latino boys and teens are so targeted by police, right? That's reproductive justice. So Black Lives Matter is a reproductive justice issue. Um, you know, defunding, going back to that, you know, what's happening in Texas, but really what's been happening for this last several decades, ever since the right to abortion was won in 1973, states have been chipping away at that right uh, with hundreds of laws across the states um, over the last several decades, and now culminating in what we see today, which is, you know, women can't get access to abortions in many rural places, and now in certain states like Texas. And what this means um, is that it's disproportionately impacting poor women, right? Um, so there's organizations, uh, reproductive justice organizations in Texas that are now engaging in and doing things like helping women cross borders to go into other states um, and helping them pay for that, helping them you know, get paid for the 
money that they're losing by taking off work to go do that um, in order to access abortions in other states. And again, this is largely poor um, and low income women of color. Um, even though doing so, that opens up those organizations um, to be sued uh, by the state under this bounty driven surveillance uh, system that the state of Texas has set up. Um, this also means that over the last several decades, we've seen a defunding of reproductive health centers, so like Planned Parenthood, right, uh, which aren't even places where abortions happen. They're places where people go to get birth control, STI and HIV testing, right, pregnancy tests, sometimes their annual exams, um, but they are targeted as places of, you know, all abortion. And so therefore uh, their funding is cut or their funding is, you know, moved to other areas or they can't get funding unless they share misinformation um, about pregnancy um, uh, and sexuality. Um, so we've seen, right, the, the sort of need for reproductive justice in this country for many, many years. Um, we also see, I'll just give a couple other examples. Um, we see how women who are, um, incarcerated or detained, right, in the detention centers, um, report being sexually assaulted by guards and by uh, other inmates. Um, women, particularly sex workers, I do a lot of work with sex workers in the U.S., um, sex workers are, are very afraid of police because police are the ones who physically and sexually assault them. Not so much their clients, right, it's the police who are doing that. And who do you report to when it's the police who are doing it? So feminists of color have been the ones who are leading the call to abolish ICE, to abolish policing, to abolish mass incarceration. If you remember the um, uh, big, you know, uh, protests from last summer, summer 2020, um, two summers ago, um, you know, we saw in the U.S. and around the world, right, these massive amounts of people coming out to protest police brutality. Right. Um, to protest against the ways that the criminal justice system is a violently racist form of social control that is not only racist, but also very sexist and transphobic and homophobic. Right? And so you would see protest signs that would say, like, you know, defund the police, abolish the police, abolish the NYPD, defund, decarcerate, disarm. Um, and so, again, this is all interconnected. So when we talk about intersectional feminism, it's not just about this individual, like, this person was racist and sexist towards this other person. It's these institutions that we are a part of, right? Racism and sexism are embedded into those institutions, right? The criminal justice system is working as it was intended to work, which is as a very racist and sexist institution. Um, all right, I'm going to stop share for a minute just because I want to get some, um, the Poet X. Yes, love the Poet X. Sorry, that was a feed, uh, throwback to an earlier comment. But um, is this new information to you? Do you, have you heard about what's going on in Texas? Do you hear a lot about reproductive justice in New York City or Jersey or the surrounding areas? You can just give me some chats. What does it mean to be talking about, you know, abolish the police when you're at John Jay? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Jeanette. <laughs> when you were talking about how women were being sterilized against their will, that really like took me off guard because I had no idea that was happening to them at all. And I think it's pretty effed up because like they have a right if they want to continue producing more kids or not. And it shouldn't be the government's like choice to do so, like to control that aspect of their life because motherhood is very important to a lot of women and for them to just take it upon themselves to, hey, you can't have kids anymore. It's just pretty messed up to me. Yeah, it's, it's dictating, it's the government dictating like, okay, we don't want black and brown families to grow, right? Like that's just eugenics, like that's messed up, right? Um, and again, that, that, that power, that ability of to have bodily autonomy, right, has been taken away, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? Let's see, I see, no, I barely hear from it because I don't watch TV or use social media. And to be quite honest, like, you might hear about it on TV, um, not as much. Social media, depending on which social media and like, 
are you deep into activist networks on social media or is it just, you know, like friends and family, right? Um, but yeah, we often don't hear about this. It's not something that is common knowledge per se. Um, have been hearing about what's happening in Texas and the dangers it's causing. You've heard about ICE doing it. Um, I love people who've had abortions. Yeah, I mean, abortions, like, it's, it's a medical procedure and it should be completely available. It's a medical thing, right? Um, someone said in a direct message, it makes them think about the one child policy in China, right? The government trying to control the rate at which women can have children, right? And really trying to control, um, in that sense, the actual overall family planning. But here in the US, what makes it so different is that it's racially, uh, you know, it's based on race, right? Um, yeah, exactly. Not, you shouldn't force someone to have a child or not have a child, right? Exactly, exactly. All right, I'm gonna go back to share screen for a little bit here. So I provide that example because it's been intersectional feminists who have been calling out the need for radical change and for a visionary feminism, which is what Black feminist scholar Bell Hooks, um, and she does lowercase her name, that's not a typo. Bell Hooks talks about a visionary feminism where we envision this future, right? Where, where we aren't dependent on mass incarceration, where sexual assaults are not just common everyday occurrences, right? Where domestic violence is a thing of the past, right? Um, and so they're calling out this need for a radical change and for abolition. And it's really um, black feminists and black womanists, right? Because black feminists um, in around the seventies were like, you know, feminism is so white uh, that we feel excluded and we don't even connect to the F word. So we're gonna call ourselves womanists. But then that can be hard because now today, right? There's trans people and gender non-conforming people who are feminists and they're black and they're like, but where do I fit, right? Language is always evolving and as fierce advocates for justice, it's part of our sort of duty, right? To, to stay engaged and understand and follow this evolution of language because even our language that we're taught is incredibly, um, binary and gendered and racist um, as well. Um, so, you know, Black feminists, Black womanists, um, Asian American Pacific Islander feminisms, uh, mujeristas and feministas, you know, whether we're talking about Chicana or Chicane or Chicanex feminism, um, you also see the X or E used sometimes, like the Latinx Studies Department here at John Jay. Uh, because the OA, right, is such a very gendered and gendered binary thing. So in the U.S., we started using the X as that stand-in. Outside the U.S., they often use E. Um, so it's like Latin A, Latin A um, because it's easier to say than Latinx, right? The X is a very harder uh, sound. Um, there's Hotharia studies, there's transnational feminism, Islamic feminism, South Asian feminism, indigenous feminism, right? These are feminists who are saying things like, look, if we are going to fight for the right to abortion, we have to fight for the right to not be sterilized. We have to fight for the right to not worry about our kids being killed by police. But what gets funded, what gets attention, right, um, is often abortion and right and access to abortion, which again is very important for people of all racial identities and ethnic identities. But it's not the only thing. And so when white feminism comes in, white feminism tends to focus on just what's important for white folks, right? Um, and so this racism is is there is a racism that's built into our social structures and institutions, including mainstream feminist activism. Um, we saw this with, and continue to see this with rights for LGBTQ people. You know, LGBTQ people uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, when the sort of modern day US LGBTQ movement started, uh, were really focused on issues that were important to queer people of color, such as access to housing, access to employment, um, you know, access to, to food, right, sort of basics, um, because LGBTQ people of color were, uh, and at that point, legally, right, being discriminated against and not being rented apartments, not being given jobs, and so we're often then re re uh, having to resort to street economies, you know, selling sex, selling drugs, you know, uh, in order to survive. And then those things were criminalized, right? And then they're arrested and incarcerated. And so you see how the system sort of builds on itself. So mainstream feminist activism is often very white or white and white. So you can think about um, 
things like Hillary Clinton or the former woman Facebook CEO, um, you know, Sheryl Sandberg, who's like, we just got to lean in and we just need a seat at the table and we just need more women in politics and then everything will be okay. But we've seen what happens when white women get into political positions or positions of power and they're often still much more beholden to white supremacy than to actual gender justice for all. Um, and so you have feminists of color who are reading, who are researching and writing about things like the book on the left against white feminism. Um, you have scholars and activists who are, who are writing about and researching very specifically, like what does, um, you know, what do Mujeristas do? What does black feminism and womanism look like? What does Indo-Caribbean feminist thought look like? Right? One thing I always like to point out when I talk about this in my own classes is that white feminism is a racist feminism. So it's not an equivalency of saying like, you know, Latinx feminism or AAPI feminism, because those feminisms are very much about like, look, race and gender have to be looked at together. White feminism, like anybody who's ascribing to white feminists, uh, white feminism, like wouldn't take on that label, right? These are white people um, or people of color who are remaining vested to being attached to white supremacy for the little bits of power that it might afford them. Um, we see this a bit in political circles. Um, but there's this, I mean, I kind of hate the term white feminism because it should really just be racist feminism, right? Or white supremacist feminism. These are, oops. Oops. And so, you know, when we talk about activism and fierce advocacy for justice, it's important to realize that it's really emotional. You know, activism is, is struggle. Um, it's hope and pain and empowerment and inspiration and joy, but also disappointment and anger right, and rage um, and so many other feelings and actions. What's really hard is that for feminists of color, they're also dealing with transphobia, homophobia, and sexism in racial justice movements. So for example, um, Martin Luther King um, and you know, the uh, push for civil rights and racial justice in the 60s, you know, amazing, amazing, did amazing things for racial justice, but Martin Luther King was really sexist. And you know, it was hard because internally black women are like, we gotta support the struggle for racial justice, but this sexism is just bad, right? Um, and so then it becomes a place where, where feminists of color are stuck because there's so much racism within feminist movements and so much sexism and homophobia and transphobia and racial justice movements. So where is that space to breathe or to connect or to inspire, right? Or just to rest. Um, the books I have here, one is called The Will to Change by Bell Hooks, again, black feminist um, scholar. And she wrote this book called The Will to Change on Men, Masculinity and Love to try to call in men, particularly black men, but all men, um, to understand how patriarchy is actually really harmful to them by limiting their feelings and their experiences. And that if they can turn away from that, right, that their lives would be fuller and happier. But they have to have that will, that want to change. Um, the other book, I know you might not be able to see the subtitle as well, um, it's called The Solidarity Struggle, How People of Color Succeed and Fail at Showing Up for Each Other. Like that, that's deep and it hurts, right? But that theme is also part of activism because it's how you continue building forward. Um, the forward there written by Cece McDonald, um, she is a black trans woman who was arrested and imprisoned for defending herself against a violently vicious um, trans, uh, transphobic and racist attack um, on the street. And so this is why in gender studies or in your activism, um, in, in the work that you want to do, because clearly you're interested in it, right? Paying attention to what Black, Indigenous, and other feminists of color are showing us, because they're showing us that we can't understand gender and sexism without also understanding race and racism. They are intertwined, right? Um, and so you have had, you know, uh, black, indigenous, and other feminists of color who are academics, but they're also activists, right? And so they're writing about this because they're writing and telling the stories and sharing the research 
so that we don't forget that, for example, the U.S. has this really horrible long history of forcibly sterilizing um, people when they are in jail or prison or in deportation or detention centers or seeking services from, you know, county hospitals. Or what I didn't mention earlier, um, in Puerto Rico, uh, they were testing um, uh, birth control in Puerto Rico in the 60s and 70s, and ended up sterilizing many women um, against their will. And the U.S. was doing this in Puerto Rico because they could, you know, the, the companies could get away with that uh, because Puerto Rico is a, ter- is a territory, not a state. So feminists are trying to make the world and have made the world a better place. Um, you have, you know, this, I love, I love some of these books as well. So I wanted to share them with you. Afro-Puerto Rican uh, women building environmental justice to make livable worlds. The Color of Violence Anthology is a mix of chapters written by different people, um, edited by an organization called Insight Women of Color Against Violence. You can look up and Google and join up right now. Um, Asian American feminism and women of color politics, right? Like Asian uh, women, um, you know, Asian, South Asian, Pacific Islander have long been involved in politics um, in the U.S., but we often don't hear them. Uh, We often aren't taught about them or taught to hear them. So um, I just want to talk about this and then we'll start to wrap up because then I just want to have a conversation. Uh, Because we are at John Jay, I really want to point out how feminists of color are leading the calls for abolition in the United States. Abolition is a word that is connected directly to that word of abolition from, um, uh, from when the US had people who were enslaved, right? Bringing people over from Africa as well as some other folks. Um, but largely from Africa and enslaving them, right? So enslaved people were fighting for their rights to not be enslaved. They wanted to abolish slavery. So they were called abolitionists, right? Scholars like Michelle Alexander um, have studied and researched how the institution of slavery itself, you know, that ended, but this sort of racialized form of social control, that never ends. It just changes shape. So that violent racialized form of social control back in the day in the US was slavery. Slavery was abolished. And then we got Jim Crow laws, which were specifically racialized laws that would say things like, um, you know, this is a black neighborhood, this is a white neighborhood. You know, black people can't live in the white neighborhood. We have to have different educational facilities for black youth and white youth, right? Um, And it was very explicit written into the laws that way, right? Race was mentioned explicitly in the laws. Then after 1964 with Martin Luther King and others, like that became illegal. You can't say, right, that things are so racialized in that way. So now what we have is this coded language and coded implementation of these laws. So according to Michelle Alexander and Angela Davis and so many others who do this work, the new form of violent racialized social control is the criminal justice system. It's mass incarceration. So that means it's policing, It's the courts, it's jails and prisons, right? It's the alternatives to incarceration that are offered up so that you don't have to go to jail, but if you mess that up or you don't do it or something else happens, then you do go to jail. So that threat of imprisonment is always there. Michelle Alexander, Victoria Law, um, Dean State, so many others are arguing that we need to abolish policing and we need to abolish imprisonment because it's not keeping us safe, right? Prisons will not protect you. If you look at the data, prisons don't keep anyone safe, right? They disappear social problems, as uh, Black feminist scholar Angela Davis uh, says, um, and they uh, tear apart, you know, families of color, similar to how the uh, immigrant immigration um, immigrant detention centers are tearing apart, you know, largely um, Latin ex families, but not completely. Um, also, certainly. Uh, uh, other families as well. Um, But in the US, we tend to hear about and focus on uh, Latinx families, but this is also impacting South Asian families, um, certain uh, families from certain African countries who tend to come to the US, right, seeking better ways of of living. Um, This is also why we see things like we're criminalizing asylum at the border, and we're seeing things, um, if you saw a couple weeks ago, like Border Patrol on a horse whipping a Black Haitian man. Like that, that is the times of slavery. Like slavery has not, you know, really ended. It's just changed shape. And it's women of color who are calling this out. 
the white women, the white feminists are like, oh, we just need reforms. We just need better training. We just need diversity training, right? And what many of these scholars and activists are saying is like, nah, we've been doing those trainings and diversity trainings and you know, making all these reforms for decades and nothing has changed. So they're arguing that we have to abolish these institutions and instead fund um, things that are focused on community health and well-being, community accountability, education, right? Stop building so many prisons and build more schools, better schools, um, smaller class sizes, right? Making higher education free for all. Uh, okay. So activism can mean many, many, many things. People tend to think of activism as, as marching in the streets, which is activism. Um, or like lobbying their political representative. Um, and there's many, many ways that you can get involved as a fierce advocate for gender justice. Um, mainstream wise, right? You could do things like letter writing to your political representatives, voting, right? We always hear, get out the vote, register people to vote, right? Because there's such a long history of voter disenfranchisement in the US as well, particularly in poor communities of color. Uh, especially black communities, right? Um, and so, you know, voting, exercising that right to vote. Um, you can go on the website Idealist um, and find jobs, internships, or volunteer opportunities around their range of social justice efforts and ideas. And then you have more radical activist efforts where activists like um, Michelle Alexander and Angela Davis and Bell Hooks and um, Victoria Law and so many more are arguing that bureaucracies and governments are sources of violence, not protection, that they have never protected us. And so we must dismantle, defund, decolonize, and rebuild, right? Um, I also like to point out that activism can also just be existing. Your existence is resistance is also a very popular slogan. So if you are you know, a woman, if you are, very particularly a woman of color, right? If you are a trans person of color, a femme of color, someone, um, someone who's non-binary of color, right? The social world doesn't see you, doesn't value you, and doesn't care about your existence. So even just existing is resistance. And existing in joy, you think about like, um, you know, black boy joy and black girl magic, right? That that very existence is resistance in the face of a society that is so heavily racist and sexist and homophobic and transphobic and discriminatory. So there are ways to get involved locally. Um, these are just a few examples of organizations um, that are, are local. So the Audrey Lord Project, the Sylvia Rivera Law Project are both here in New York City. Um, Black and Pink and Survive and Punished are organizations that are national but have local chapters. Um, many of these organizations, these are a mix of organizations that do reproductive justice, abolitionism, trans rights, support for incarcerated people. For example, example Black and Pink um, does letter writing and um, uh, puts money on the books for and helps people transition uh, for LGBTQ people who are incarcerated. Survived and Punished focuses on women of color uh, who are incarcerated for defending themselves against domestic violence or sexual assault. Because even though in the US we have a right to self-defense, that is always or fairly regularly denied to women of color. Um, we have sex worker rights orgs like the Black Sex Worker Collective in New York City, Red Canary Song in New York City, Critical Resistance, which is a prison abolitionist project started by Angela Davis. And then other organizations that aren't necessarily um, people of color focused, but are very inclusive, like Hollaback, which is around street harassment, the Anti-Violence Project here in New York City for LGBTQ people who are experiencing sexual assault, domestic violence, hate crimes, um, other forms of violence, Advocates for Youth, which I'm gonna show you their website um, here in a little bit, and also the Transgender Law Center. I know that that was a lot of information, yeah, okay, I see somebody, their AP teacher made you read the new Jim Crow and gifted everybody a copy. Yeah, the uh, John Jay did this maybe five or six years ago now, like all incoming first years got that book and they all read it as part of their um, uh, incoming um, classes, right, the new Jim Crow. Um, and it's just really interesting to me because again, we're at John Jay, the College of Criminal Justice, 
but criminal justice is incredibly violent. So what does that mean, right? We're kind of stuck. And so this is where feminists of color um, have been leading the way and continue to really lead the way um, in terms of pointing to how to fix this and how to fix this in a way that isn't just going to, you know, perpetuate violence um, in communities of color. So I feel like I just talked a lot. I did talk a lot. So questions, confusions, have I confused you? What's been the most interesting thing that you learned today? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> um, when you mentioned Martin Luther King was sexist, I wanted to ask like, how was he sexist? What did he say or do? So, um, I can't, I, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to quote anything, um, but just there were women who were working, you know, what was it? the civil rights effort was a lot, right? And so the women, many women, Black women were doing the letter writing, helping write speeches, um, coordinating to get everybody together, making sure there was childcare so that people could go marching. Um, and not only were they never really thanked for that, that was just seen as work that they should be doing. Right. Um, and and um, in addition to actually going on to their other work to, to actually make money um, and put food on the table, um, in addition to, you know, I think he's just he said some sexist things. And I, I, I'm not going to quote anything because I'm probably going to quote incorrectly in this moment, but I encourage everybody to Google it. <laughs> and I can also find um, a couple of the a couple scholarly sources to share with you and you can share with everybody, too, if, if you want. Right. Um, but really this discounting of women of women and of women's work. Right. Um, and so Martin Luther King, you know, gets all the all the accolades, but the women don't or even um, one of his close advisors, whose name I'm blanking on right now, um, was, is, was gay, but as a black gay man, right, they, they were like, you got to stay in the closet, like, don't come out. It's like, we got to just focus on the black man, and then everybody else gets rights as the black man gets rights, right? Um, and we saw, yes, yes, Bayard Rustin. Thank you, Bridget. <laughs> yeah, the chat, always there to help out. Um, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Other questions, confusions? So does this fit with what you're learning in your other classes or not really? Um, in one of my other classes, I take ISP 100. Mm -hmm. and it's called who's in and who's out. And we're basically discussing who's morally included in American society and who's more excluded and we all know who's the included ones by people but yeah one of the our readings was out of the new Jim Crow mm -hmm. laws and how it basically talks about like how slavery has been modernized throughout the entire course of American history we talked about the rebirth of slavery the rebirth the death of slavery the rebirth of Jim Crow and then the death of Jim Crow and then so on, so on. And I thought it was pretty cool because like, I just, I knew like it, there was historical context it, like the effects of slavery is definitely impacts today, black people, but I just didn't know how to like properly like say it or explain it to other people. So reading like that chapter helped me have a better understanding so I can be able to educate other people on how slavery still affects black people to this day, systematically. Yes, yes, I like how you said that too, like like you didn't really have the language, right? Or you didn't know how to say it, like you feel it, right? Um, and that's, that's very much what learning about fierce advocacy for justice is about, right? Like you're learning the language to make sense of your experience and learning the history, right, of, of you. <laughs> um, and, you know, what has shaped everything in the world that has led to you being here and how you're being treated and respected or not respected in it, right? Um, and I think that scholars like Michelle Alexander and other scholars of color are doing so much work to ensure that we have that language. Um, whereas, um, how do I say it? So I'm not gonna name names, but someone very high up at John Jay, we were in this meeting with students and faculty and staff. And she said, you know, don't protest, just email me. And I was like, 
you just came out here and quoted John Lewis, who was a black man who was really, you know, a uh, long time, you know, congressman um, who had passed away, but was real big in the civil rights movement. And he was, he was the one who would always say, get in good trouble, get good trouble. Like that's activism. But yet she, like this person was like, well, but don't, don't do that. Just send me an email. <laughs> and it's like, you're allowed to have those feelings, right? Those feelings of anger and, and to assemble around them. Um, and let me see, I just wanna see over here. Yeah, when you read, like reading. And so to me, activism is also learning, right? And I know that I'm a professor and so I'm dorky in that way, but I truly believe that when you learn from reading, from, you know, storytelling, um, through, um, you know, reading activism and academic research, you know, you're learning how and why the world works as it does. So you don't feel so weird or lonely or afraid or like, am I crazy? Right? Like I often have feelings like, am I crazy? <laughs> right? Um, it's like, no, I'm, I, I am not like, this is how the world works, but it's trying to convince you that it doesn't. Right? Um, I see somebody said, we just saw Black Feminist Thought in a Gender Studies class. Good job, Professor Woods. Read a lot of Audre Lorde. Audre Lorde is also, um, so Audre Lorde self-defined as a uh, Black feminist warrior poet lesbian. I think I did that in the right order. Um, and wrote books like Sister Outsider. And she, I mean, she wrote so much. I mean, just books and books and books. She did a lot of poetry. Um, and really is considered one of the, you know, to use a gendered term, like grandmothers of women and gender studies in the U.S. today. So gender studies and women's studies uh, in the U.S. exists because of women of color. It was Asian, Black, and um, Latinx women who were working in English and sociology and, and, you know, science departments. And they were like, we cannot handle the intense amount of racism and sexism in these fields. We have to have a field where we're studying how gender organizes the social world and how important it is to see how gender and race impact our experiences. Um, Sister Love, yes, with Pat Parker, yes, yes. I mean, it's funny, I'm a sociologist by training, but I also do gender studies and I do gender studies because I love art and poetry. And I think that that is also really powerful in terms of activism, right? Um, Audre Lorde actually taught at John Jay in the 70s and left John Jay. Um, at that point, she wasn't out as a lesbian. Um, she, um, you know, but she, she's teaching at John Jay in the 70s, black woman, fro, the whole thing, like activist, has a son, a young son. And um, at some point while she in John Jay at this time was very much the cop college. It was a two year school where people who were in fire services and policing would come to get their degree so that you could move up right the ranks and um, both in terms of you know moving up the ranks, but also making more money. And she was teaching a class. And uh, at one point during that weekend or later that week, a black boy was killed by police in Queens. And there was a lot of outcry from black communities and other communities and you know, white accomplices and allies. And she returned to class and did not feel safe staying in that classroom for herself or for her son. And so she left John Jay. And John Jay does not like to talk about that, <laughs> right? Because we like to think of ourselves as on the cutting edge of fierce advocacy. Um, and so these are really, really, really hard, difficult conversations to have at John Jay. Um, and that's one reason why I'm introducing it to you through this justice talk to Justice Walk, because it's in many ways, we're still at that talk stage uh, because there it's so hard to envision a world where safety and accountability can occur without mass incarceration and imprisonment, right? To imagine a world where racism doesn't exist. Like think about that as a thought project, right? Um, and for those of us who are white, it means being not just an ally, I like to use the word accomplice because accomplice means like we're gonna mess something up. Like we want to change something. We want to challenge the status quo. We don't want the things to be as they have been because as they have been, have been incredibly violent um, and problematic. Right. So I do want to show one other thing. Um, and then I know that y'all are going to have to wrap up. Um, doo -doo -doo, but I like it. So there's an organization. Sorry, I can come back here. Called Advocates for Youth that is actually a um, national organization, it's in DC, but they have chapters all over. 
Uh, Advocates for Youth is by and for young people. They largely focus on reproductive justice for young people of color, but they do lots of other uh, work as well. And one of the tools that I use from them when I teach my classes is their Youth Activist Toolkit. And so they actually have scroll down so you can see table of contents. So if you are like, you know, I don't know if I want to get involved with an organization yet, but you know, I feel like there's something on campus that isn't sitting right with me. Um, You know, there's something going on in my community and I I feel like we need to take action. This is a step-by-step guide on how to get started, how to organize, how to map power, how to build collective power, going over tactics and strategies, right? Um, So I'm going to put this in the Uh, I'm going to put it in the chat um, just so that you have it, but it's a really helpful, sorry, I can't type and talk at the same time. It's a really helpful tool that I use when I teach about social justice, Um, and it's something that is easy to follow along and map with. You know, they they have a social problems tree that's literally a tree, so you're envisioning leaves and roots, right? They have ways of mapping things like with shapes um, to create these sort of uh, understandings of how power flows and who to talk to, right? Um, I think about changes on campus, um, you know, students have had to fight to have gender neutral bathrooms on campus and that's still not great the way that it's been done. Um, Students had to fight uh, because if you've been on the campus, I know some of you might not have been yet um, because of COVID, but there's a spot in the new, in the main building where everybody hangs out um, that is in between two sets of stairs and there wasn't an elevator. So anyone who was, you know, in a wheelchair or had other mobility issues and couldn't use stairs couldn't actually hang out in this like main hangout spot. So students were like, y'all have to put in an elevator. And they're like, well, there's not enough money to put in an elevator. There's always money. We do have gender neutral bathrooms. There's not very many. Um, Let me see if I can pull up the map really quick. It's also hard because the way that they did gender neutral bathrooms, for example, at Heron Hall was like slap a a sign on the men's bathroom that says this is the gender neutral bathroom, lock the door behind you. And I've gone into that gender neutral bathroom many times. um, And I would say 70% of the time that door is unlocked and I accidentally walk in on people. Like I start knocking, you know, and I'm just like walking in on, on someone who is peeing in a, you know, urinal and I'm just like you're supposed to lock the door like one of them like he even had he had his phone like propped up against the mirror while he was peeing and I was like talking to the phone he he was supposed to lock the door (laughs) um so we do we also do have uh, lactation rooms let me see if I can look it up real quick John Jay gender neutral bathrooms um and if not I do have a um oh here we go And it's hard because they're, you know, not always um, easily accessible and not always easily accessible depending on where your class is, right? Um, And yeah, I'll just say that, yeah. Good questions, other questions? Questions for me about gender studies, about sex work, about Las Vegas. I would show you my little dog, but he is hiding right now. I know this is a lot, a lot of information. So I appreciate y'all coming and engaging with me and digesting. And I do encourage you to reach out to me. Um, I'm gonna put my email in the chat. Um, oh, somebody asked me why I left Vegas. I left Vegas for this job. So I am from Vegas. I went to community college in Vegas um, and then um, ended up staying in Vegas. I never meant to become a PhD, but I did. And uh, was looking for an academic job and you're not, you can't really get a job where you got your degree. Um, And so I got offered this job out here and I was like, I'll take it (laughs) after being in grad school for 10 years. (laughs) Um, And I chose gender studies because even though my PhD is in sociology, I have a graduate level emphasis in what was called women's studies um, at the time Um, because it's, the best tool that I have seen, gender studies, is the best tool in understanding why and how inequalities and violences are so enduring. You know, like we have laws against racist, you know, um, hiring practices. We have laws against rape, but those things still happen all the time, right? So like what's going on? And I find that gender studies is open to answering those questions um, and tends to be the ones that have the most insights, right? Um, into answering those questions. So, you know, the answer isn't 
more women on the police force, the answer is dissolve the police force, disarm the police force, and let's focus on, you know, conflict resolution, community accountability, health care, mental health care, um, and, you know, livable wage jobs, right? Um, I could probably talk for hours on why I chose gender studies. <laughs> Uh, but I will say gender studies is cool, obviously, because I'm in it, so I think it's cool. But in my opinion, it's cool. Um, because not only do you take gender studies classes, GEN classes, you also take classes from across the college. So you'll take classes, it's optional which ones you take, but you'll have the option of taking classes from sociology, history, biology, um, economics, drama, right? Like there's a dance one that I actually personally really want to take. Um, <laughs> art. Um, you know, I, so many more that I think I'm blanking out on. So you start to see how feminism, particularly intersectional feminism, it's, we're everywhere. We're everywhere. <laughs> so I think that's it for my time. And so I want to make sure that y'all have time to do your wrap up. Um, but I'm happy to entertain more questions or entertain questions via email. And I thank you so much. Thank you so much. Can we get a round of applause uh, for Dr. Jackson and this wonderful presentation? I want to see claps. I want to see it in the chat. If you do have any questions, please, please, please make sure that you you got her, her um, email from the chat or ask them now before we, before we end today. Um, uh, if you want to... Um, if you're interested in more ways that you can make a difference, I want to bring attention to our next justice event that's coming up. Um, it's Did You See That? Preventing Wrongful Conviction in Eyewitness Cases. Um, you can RSVP. I'm going to drop the link in the um, in the chat. And I'm actually, I'm going to ask you one question, Dr. Jackson, because I'm interested in what you think about um, how your topic uh, crosses over with eyewitness testimony in terms of who is a more believable eyewitness. Yeah, I mean, so I'm not up on that research right now, but you know, you think historically, let's just go back to um, white women accusing black men of sexual assault, like in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, uh, and 60s and 70s, um, and they were automatically believed. But those sexual assaults didn't happen. Right. Um, and so, you know, like one was, you know, a black boy like whistled at a woman. Um, other times it was just a look. Other times it just didn't happen at all. Um, and it often ended with that black man being lynched. Right. So then think historically about then how that has evolved today and who is considered um, uh, a, a reliable eyewitness. Right. Um, and so white people um, in particular, I think there's still that that um, assumption there or just that if you are black or or gender nonconforming or particularly um, seem out of place for whatever other reasons around gender, race and sexuality, that you're not as believed, as well as eyewitness testimony is just notoriously bad. Our memories are really bad, right? So I know like in our psychology department um, um, and I think maybe in a couple other departments, like they're studying, like we are, we, we love our memories. We're good at memory, like we like memories, but our memories are not good, right? Like we forget things very quickly. And because we have so, we've been raised in a society that is racist and sexist and homophobic and transphobic. And so those internal biases that we often don't know that we have, our, our shaping, right, our remembering of events, right, or even shaping how that memory is being coded in that moment, right. Um, so there's some cool science about that, right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you'll probably learn a lot about that too from that upcoming one. That sounds very cool. I like that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I hope everyone today is now an accomplice. Um, yes. And everyone, please enjoy your afternoon. Thank you again. One last round of applause as we're exiting. Um, and I did see in the chat a question about the recording. Yes, we're going to uh, make this recording available to everyone who couldn't make it today. Um, any follow-up questions, please make sure to reach out. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it so much. <laughs>